Oh, come on, church, lift them up this morning. Come on. Let's just sing that almighty fortress bit again, just that bridge, all right? Can we do that? Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the you grab a seat this morning, church. You know, when we come to church, we sing songs. We're not just singing songs. I was uh, reading an article during uh, the week, and uh, it, was a, it was a woman who was writing. She was uh, like a neurosurgeon, psychiatrist, therapist, a whole bunch of ists at the end of her name. And uh, she was just writing about how to uh, avoid anxiety in your life, how to try and live a life that had you know, very low stress. And she had three tips for things that she did to try and minimize stress and anxiety in her life. And the first thing she said she did, she said, I never, ever watch horror movies. She's not a Christian. She said, I never, ever watch horror movies because what the horror movies do is it stirs up this fear response in your life. And she said, that's incredibly damaging to your body flood your body with toxins. This is a non-Christian, not a believer, saying, I never watch horror movies. The second thing she said, which I found fascinating, she said, I never listen to negative music. She said, because science has proven over and over and over again that when you sing something out and your brain hears you singing it, it becomes a part of your psyche. She said, so I never listen to negative music because I don't want to ever be singing out negativity and then my brain hears it. And I thought, man, how powerful is that truth when you apply it to worship music, when you start singing out worship music? And how many of us would say that sometimes we don't feel overly eloquent in our prayer life? Man, you just open up the Bible and read out a psalm out loud and you're like a poet. It's beautiful, right? Uh, Or you might go, look, I don't feel that I'm overly much of a wordsmith, but you stand up and you sing the words to that song and you are singing over your life like the most beautiful stuff and your brain hears it and it embeds in you. Like it's not just a box that we tick worship. It literally changes who you are as a person. Is that cool? We're going to sing that bit again now that I've educated you. FYI, I'm Josh. I forgot to say that at the start. If you're a guest with us this morning, it's great we lead here with the rest of the team. So next, we're just going to sing that again, Almighty Fortress. But as you sing it, I just want you to be aware that you're literally rewiring your brain. Literally. Literally. You are literally rewiring. There are synapses or synapses that are firing in your brain. You can change the way that you think about certain situations. It is not a figurative rewiring. It is a literal rewiring. If you want to read a great book, read Switched On brain by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. It's a great book. Anyway, 
I don't want to get into the science of it. I just want you to know that, that Christianity and science are not mutually exclusive. That a lot of what we believe is backed in science. And we're just like light years ahead of the science discovering it. Thousands of years ago, someone wrote the power of life and death is in the tongue. And now science is starting to go, actually, when you speak stuff out loud and your brain hears it, it is rewiring your thought patterns. Literally, literally. So glad my brother's back in church. All right. Come on, let's just sing it, Almighty Fortress. And Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. Stand against the power of our God and Almighty Fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. All right, very good. Now you can sit down again what you've now done, you've just declared that over your life. Your brain's just here, just singing it. Your brain's going, man, God's an almighty fortress. He goes before me. Nothing can stand against the power of God. Heck yeah! Thanks, Amanda. All right. You guys want some notices? First of all, oh, Andy, you want to say something? What was that? Sorry? Oh, I don't know. That was the second thing was what struck me so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, th- uh, the third thing. It's something to do with memory. I don't, I don't know. Um, oh, th- but then I also read another article. Oh, it's going to be one of those Sundays, guys. Buckle yourselves in. Or another article uh, that a nurse had written, like a triage nurse. Nurses, man, is a nurse, flipping amazing. Who reckons that they could do what a nurse does? I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And so they, they studied all these nurses, and they were like, there's a group of nurses that go home, and they don't carry their work home with them. They're not carrying their stress home. And then there's a bunch of nurses that go home, and they just can't unplug. And they were like, what's the difference? And there were three things that these nurses were doing. Now, this is a whole sermon now. Three things that these nurses were doing to not three. Yes, three. And I remember the three of them. Right. First one was exercise. Like, they were like, exercise is really important. No, I didn't like that one. I scrapped that one. And then the second one, the second one was they said, I'm not even joking, the third one's just completely gone. Um, but the second one was uh, they connected with friends and family a lot. Oh, I remember now. And then the third one was they had a hobby that used their hands, like, you know, gardening or writing or whatever. And they said, they said these three things, just about, like, distracting your brain. From the start, like so often, how many people, like so often, you're just like, man, I'm just stressed. And then you just can't stop thinking about the thing that you're stressed about. And it just makes you more stressed. So they say, look, if you go to the gym or whatever exercise, you go for a run, it's really hard to think about what you're stressed about while you physically feel that you're dying. So they said, exercise is really good because it pushes it out of your brain. And like hanging out with friends and family and talking to them about, you know, their problems and go, oh, your life is so much worse than mine. It also helps you remove your stress. And then the third thing is, yeah, like getting, getting physical with your hands, like getting out into nature or whatever it is that you like doing. Huh. So you know, I preach my sermon now. We don't need to worry about that later today. Notices. Okay. Holy moly. Notices. First of all, if you want to stay connected to the life of the church after everything you just heard, uh, then that's awesome. Uh, you can fill out uh, a contact form out the back or you can email us your details and we will keep in touch with you so you know what's going on in the life of the church. And we'll tell you stuff. Like tomorrow night is prayer meeting down here, 7 o'clock at church. It's going to be awesome. So make sure you come down and participate in some prayer. I will also tell you stuff like the next slide. Ah, yes, that's right. Where's Rebecca? You're here. So Living Wisdom, uh, some of you would have heard of Living Wisdom. Some of you wouldn't have, but it's, it's run by a guy called David Riddell. He's got a couple of practitioners around the country. And so there is a Living Wisdom course, which is like sort of like mental health, counseling, got to we fly here, like life skills, uh, relationship skills, mental health topics, you know, dealing with addictions, parenting. It's like a complete overhaul of your entire life. And uh, Rebecca says that she's doing it. She says it's awesome. 
So if you want some details around that, there is a, a new course that is starting on the 17th of February, and it runs for uh, quite a few weeks on Saturdays and Tuesday nights. Uh, and if you want any details, Rebecca is just down the back. Rebecca, you're going to have to stand up so people know who you are. Like, like, can you get, oh, no, you're holding a baby. Like, wave your hand. She's just there down the back. There you go. The lady with, yeah, that'll narrow it down. I was going to say, the lady with the baby. That's like everyone. All right, so go and see Rebecca afterwards if you want to find out more about that. That's a, a fantastic course. And the only other thing that I wanted to remind you about too is that we would love to do at some point in the year uh, a message series based on topics that you have asked to be taught on, that you've asked to be preached about. And so we have on the tables down the back and a table out in the foyer, uh, just a little wee piece of paper that says you asked for it on it. And I just want you to write down any topic that you would love the church to preach on. We love to hear, well, what does the pastor think about this? What do the elders think about this? Like, what's our position as a church on, on this topic or anything that you're dealing with in your life that you're like, I'd really like some biblical advice on this. All right, so write it down and then just stick it in the, in the giving box out in the foyer. Just put it through the slot there. Uh, and at some point in the next term or so, we'll pull those all out. We'll look at what the most common requests are. Uh, and we'll look to do a series on that, all right? So that's your chance. If you've ever sat in church and gone, man, why have we never heard anything about this? Or I'd love to hear more about that. This is your chance to uh, have your say, all right? Very good. Children, you ready to go? If you're a guest with us this morning and you brought kids, good on you. We have got programs running for all of the kids that are up until the age of 13. If they're 13 or over, then they're going to stay in with us. Uh, but we've got an intermediates program running. We've got a primary school program running and a preschool program running. Uh, we've got a, a creche out there as well, and also a new mum's room, so it's all sorted. So let's do this. Let's everybody stand, because you're going to have to stand at some point anyway. And uh, one of the things we love to do is just pray for the kids as they go. Not you going to stay in, Tabitha, are you? Yes, because you're 14. Oof, so old. All right, let's just stretch, it, stretch your hands out to the kids if you want to. I'm just going to pray a blessing over them. Father, we just bless our children this morning. Lord, we thank you that your word says you raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. And we just declare this morning over every single child represented here, every single child represented through online or even listening to this on the podcast, that, Lord, that they will not depart from the path that you have for them. They won't look to the left or the right, that they will be uh, purposed and determined to live out the life that you have created for them. That they will be leaders and influences of their generation. That they are the head and not the tail. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, out you go. If you're over 13, you can stay in. And uh, for those of us that are staying in this space, we're just going to have some worship this morning. I'll have a chat to you about a couple of things a little bit later on. One of the things that we like to do here, if you've been in this church for any length of time, you'll have heard me do this a hundred times, is we want to just be intentional about this next moment. We want to be intentional about our worship. I know that people have had busy weeks. People have got a lot of stuff going on. There's a whole bunch of things rattling around in your head. And let me tell you, the enemy does not want you to connect with God this morning. So I just want to encourage you as we stay in this space to just be intentional about seeking His face. Just for the next few moments, as we sing a couple of songs, to just go, God, I'm going to give you everything this morning. just close your eyes just block out block out everything else Father God we just lift you up you are the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before you endured the cross despising its shame Father, we come to you this morning in awe of who you are, of what you've done for us. God, we just lift you up this morning.
just get the sense, church, that there's a real, just a refreshing presence of God here this morning. And why don't we do something a little bit different? Why don't you just stay, just stay in this moment. I just want you to grab a seat, just sit down, but just sit down, even keep your eyes closed if you want. And we're just going to sing this again, just there's no place I would rather be. And I just want you to open yourself up, maybe just as you're sitting down, even just have your hands facing palm up. You know, close your eyes, just engage with God this morning. And just the picture I get is, um, you know, we went to the Gold Coast back in November and uh, one of the things that the kids love doing is just going down into the water where it's really shallow and just sitting down and just letting the waves come in and, uh, and just wash over our laps. And it's just the picture I get this morning is as we just sit here, just the wave 
of the Holy Spirit just coming in and just bringing refreshing. You know, as we look to, to dig into another year, back from holiday now, maybe some of you have even got apprehension around what this year holds. And we're just going to sing this. If you want to sing it just quietly in your chair, then sing it. If you want to just receive, then just receive. But just let him minister to you this morning. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. Than here in your love, here in your love. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. Than here in your love, here in your love. I just, I just wonder if there's someone here. It might be one person. It might apply to more than one person, or, or maybe it's it's no one. That's all right. But is there anyone here this morning? And, and when I said before that, you know, maybe you're carrying some anxiety about this year and and what's going to happen this year and how it's going to work. That you kind of felt like, oh, that that's me. I'm carrying anxiety about this year. Is there anyone here at all? Yep, one there, one there, one there, one there. Oh, there's more than one. That's all right. I wasn't sure if there was one or more than one. Why don't you guys do a brave thing and come up the front and we're just going to, we're going to pray for you. So in, specifically when I said, hey, you're carrying anxiety around the year, if there was something that just kind of fluttered inside of you and, oh, that's me, I'm, you know, when I think about this year, there's anxiety for whatever reason, decisions you've got to make, anxiety about the unknown. Come on, just write, just real quick, it's not going to take long, just come up the front. guys just keep playing. That's awesome. I'm going to need some help. Liz, where's Steve Forrester? Is he around? He's here somewhere. It's hard to see in the lights, but that's all right. Yeah, there he is. That's cool. Dan, you got Caleb. That's all right. Cool. Just just step forward a little bit, guys, so I can... That's beautiful. Thank you. Hey, Trish. This is what I do, right? So I'm like, all right, if you if you if you want prayer for this and come forward, and then everyone comes forward, and then I'm like, ah, oh, what do I do now? You know? Do you have something? Yes, you do have something. Liz is gonna do it. Beautiful. Sometimes that happens when I've got nothing, it's because God's like, get someone else to do it. 
here, guys, if you're up the front, just, just stretch out your hands to God. Just close your eyes for a moment. Just connect with him, just like you're receiving a, a present right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence here right now. Thank you, Lord God, that anxiety doesn't come from you, that you say that you, we can cast our anxiety on you, Lord God, and that we can come to you with thanksgiving and praise, Lord, and that you change our minds. Lord, that it says that you take control and you actually rewire us to not have that anxiety anymore, that we can give that to you, Lord God. So right now, with hands stretched, we give that anxiety to you right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that it is a free gift from you, Lord God, knowing that you take all our, um, all our worry and all our concern, that you take it on the cross, that Jesus won the victory over those things. Lord God, it's a free gift, so right now we receive it. And guys, right now, as you're standing here, just say, I receive it. I receive it right now. I receive the peace that comes with knowing that you are in control, Lord. I receive the peace that knowing that my Father, who is in heaven, that is stronger and mightier than anything in the world, has got me in his hands. Right now. Right now. And just let that stuff just shake off. And you guys are going to have to remind yourself of this. I know from experience, you're going to have to remind yourself that God says that he's got this. He says that he's in control. And every time that anxiety comes on, you know the feeling. You're going to say, no, I know that my God's got this. I gave it to him. I put it at the feet of the cross. And I said, that is enough. That does not belong to me anymore. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to get some of our team to just come around and lay hands on you and just fill you with his peace, fill you with his presence right now. As always, just encourage you, if you're not up the front, you're still very much a part of this. You're still contributing to the environment and, you know, the atmosphere that we are working with up here. So I just encourage you, just stretch your hands out, be praying, just be blessing them, be saying, God, give them peace.
Father, while we're just finishing up up here, just for the last couple of minutes, why don't you just find someone reasonably close to you and just say hi. Don't be like, hi. Just like, hi. Just like, you know, reasonable level of volume. playing the guitar and you're like, man, it's killing my fingers. It's just All right. Very good. Very good. Seems real bright up here today. Hey, yeah, I know. I'm like, is the have the lights dropped down or something? Like, hello, 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 Pentecote, Kira, Bulla, Bonjour, Guten Tag, Hola. Anyone got anything else? Salama, G'day, Ni Hao, Ni Hao. Yeah, very good. Salu, Salu de Car, was that Thai? Yeah. What's what's South African? Af- Afrikaans for hello. Oweda. Kwila. Kwila. That's good. How many different nationalities can I offend in 30 seconds? Here we go. <laughs> hey, welcome to church. You guys doing all right? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. This church is the master of like non-verbal communication. God forbid a blind person comes to preach here, they wouldn't know what's going on. Um, how many people went home after last Sunday and you're like, man, I need to be more of a plop. Like, I've, I've got to be more of a plop. I haven't been a plop all of last year, but I'm going to be a plop from now on. Like, you went home, you're like, i got to plop. I'm going to be a plop. How many people weren't here last Sunday think Josh is having a stroke? Like, <laughs> how many? Who can tell me what a plop is? Who, anyone? Yeah, Anne? A person living on purpose. That is exactly what a plop is. I talked last Sunday about being a plop, about being a person living on purpose. We talked out of uh, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, which says, without vision, the people perish. And I just talked a little bit about how, uh, you know, how easy it is for life to just happen. You know, you get busy kids, family, work, you know, hobbies, Netflix, Disney Plus, Prime, Apple TV, Neon, TVNZ Plus, 
Zulu. It's, it's very hard to fit all of these responsibilities into our day. And, uh, and it's very easy for life to just kind of happen to you. I went and did a, a, a quiz during the week. Every now and again, I host corporate quizzes for pocket money because it's really easy money. You get paid a couple of hundred bucks to stand up in front of a room and read out quiz questions, and everyone just is having a great time. And uh, I just like the attention. And so I, I, went to this, I went to this corporate quiz on Wednesday, and it was a big company. I won't tell you the name of the company, but it was a big company, a couple of hundred employees. And they were all there at the quiz, and they had uh, linked in via satellite to other hubs of the company around the South Pacific. And so there was obviously a really big convention happening in Sydney, and so they had a big, I mean, the room was huge. They had a big screen, and they were watching it. And then at the end, the lady comes out, and she's like, well, we've got a great day planned for everybody. If you're in Melbourne, then you're going to be going to the escape rooms. You know, if you're in Sydney, then we've got this plan for you. And if you're in Christchurch, and then everyone in the room went, woo! And they had balloons up and stuff. She said, if you're in Christchurch, you're going to have a really awesome quiz. And they were like, ah. You know, because they've just heard, like, escape rooms and other exciting things. And, um, and, and then she said this. She said, guys, I know today's been a fun day, but tomorrow... Tomorrow we're getting back into it. And do you know the year is already 5% gone? And I was like, that's a plot right there. Like that lady is a person living on purpose. Like how many people have sat down and gone, I've only got 95% of 2024 left. What the heck am I doing with my life? Right? So I mean, that's like an extreme version of a plot. But, you know, we need to be people that are living on purpose. Uh, Romans uh, says that we know, like we know that all things work for good for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose, right? Ephesians chapter 2 says that, uh, you know, we've been created to do good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. Like there's a purpose for our life. Every single person here, you're here because God wants you here. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, and I don't want to get too much into the biological nitty-gritty, but at the moment of conception, there is anywhere from 150 to 300 million alternative versions of you that God could have chosen. At some, for some reason, right then in that moment, God went, there are 300 million different people that I could choose to bring forth onto planet Earth, and I am choosing Marla, and every other person is dead. Never going to exist. They're dead. That's, that's how important you are. Like, literally, it's the population of the United States. That's how many people do not exist today because you're sucking up their oxygen. Have you thought about that? Like, I, whether maybe you've gone through life and you've kind of been like a bit of a Debbie Downer at times, and you're like, well, I wasn't the most popular kid at school, and I wasn't the most popular person at work, and I don't have a lot of friends, and I'm not really a winner. Are you kidding me? You bet 300 million people to be alive right here, right now. And for some reason, God wants you. Ioana thinks it's really funny. But for some reason, God wants you here. Like, why? It's a big question. Uh, so I've just got a couple of questions for you this one. I want to kind of piggyback on this, this random idea that maybe you're actually here for a reason. That God's got a purpose for you and a plan for your life and a hope for your future. Let me, ask, let me ask you a question, and this is a question for you to ask yourself. Who, who do I think I am? Like, who do you think you are? Some kind of superstar. <laughs> Bonus point, who sings that song? Spice Girls. Yes. I had to go back, like, late 90s for that song. Like, who do you think you are? And the reason that I want you to ask yourself this question is because this is the single, the answer to this question is the single greatest contributing factor to the life that you have right now. The Bible puts it this way. I've said this before. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The scary thing is who you think you are is who you will be, even if you're wrong. Even if who you think you are is not who you are. Even if who you think you are is not who God created you to be. Even if who you think you are doesn't match who God thinks you are, your opinion of you will win out over God's opinion of you. 
Because it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Not as God thinks a man is, so is he. I, uh, I'm fascinated by the subconscious. I was doing some research during the week, and uh, the research was saying that every second, our conscious brains can process somewhere around 40 to 50 pieces of information in a second. There's a few different numbers floating around, but that was the general consensus, and there's some solid research around that, so I'm comfortable with that, but if you want to go and Google it and find different numbers, that's fine. But 40 to 50 pieces of information a second that your conscious mind is processing without going into a state of overwhelm, without freaking out, without it causing anxiety, you can comfortably handle 40 to 50 pieces a second that you are cognitively aware of. But your subconscious in that same second is processing 20 million pieces of information. Terrifying, right? It's the proverbial picture of the iceberg, like the bit that pokes above the water is what we know about, and then everything else underneath is happening under the surface, and we are not even aware of it. But it is influencing and impacting and directing our life. Have you guys heard it said that human beings only use like 10% of their brains? Have you ever heard that? Have you guys seen that movie Limitless with Bradley Cooper? Yeah? So he's like this kind of down on his luck, out of work loser who's just losing at life and then through a quirky series of events ends up coming into the possession of these pills. And every time he takes a pill, it moves his brain from being 10% functional to 100% functional and all of a sudden he's just a genius and he can write an entire novel in a day and he games the, sh the, the stock market and becomes super wealthy and it's quite a fascinating idea. But it's not true. Because what we now know is that, yeah, only 10% of our brains is being used cognitively, but the other 90% is not sitting there doing nothing. It's what's handling all of our subconscious stuff. Uh, and we don't even have, like, this much of an understanding about what happens in the subconscious. I was reading about one study where they took blind people who had literally had their optic nerves severed. So physically impossible for them to see. And they wired their brains up and then they would put someone in front of them, and they would just face like this. And then the person in front of them would just turn and look at them. And every time they turned to face them, there was a part of their subconscious brain that spiked. And no one knows how that's possible. Like, they can't physically see. The nerve has been severed. And yet some part of their subconscious was able to recognize whether someone was giving them attention or not, even just by turning their head. So our subconscious is incredibly powerful. And our subconscious is what drives our behavior. Have you ever reacted in a certain way or responded in a certain way to a, a stimulus and then afterwards gone, why, why did I act like that? Has that ever happened to you? Like, why, why do I struggle with this? No one else seems to struggle with this. Why do I struggle with this? Why do I have this reoccurring pattern of behavior that just keeps happening over and over? Why? Why am I doing this? Has anybody ever had that thought? I was listening to a podcast during the week, and I just found this so interesting. I was talking to Josh and Ioane about it, actually, last weekend, so it must have been the week before. Um, but the guy was saying that, you know, all of the research, it's a very, you know, grandiose statement, all of the research, but, like, legit, all of the research, 100%, nothing else disagrees with this. It's, this is the research. No, the, the vast majority of research has, has said, look, this is what happens. Every time you are faced with some sort of external... Uh, circumstance. Anytime something happens in your life, anytime something takes place, your subconscious will automatically ask you three questions. And it does this in a nanosecond, right? It can process 20 million pieces of information a second. So asking you three questions is nothing for your subconscious. And this all happens so far under the surface that you're not even aware that it's happening. But this is what your subconscious does. As soon as something happens to you, your subconscious goes, what kind of situation is this? Is this a stressful situation? Is this a scary situation? Should I be worried about my safety in this situation? Is it harmless? Is it fun? Like, what kind of situation is this? The second question your subconscious will ask is, what kind of person am I? And then the third question it will ask is how does a person like me respond to a situation like this? And so you can see how important it is to get that second question right. 
Like, it doesn't matter how hard you try to change your behavior, how hard you try to bring in a good habit. Harrison was telling me the other day that he read a book. It said 85% of all New Year's resolutions are broken by the end of January. Don't lie to me. How many people at some point have gone, I'm going to get healthy this year? Like, gym memberships go through the roof in January. Personal trainers get flooded with people asking them to help them lose weight. And they all know, Yoana was saying, they all know it's not going to last. People, like, how many times have you tried to bring in a good habit? How many times have you tried to break a bad habit and it just hasn't happened? It's because you cannot consistently act in a way that is incongruent with who you think you are. And so that second question, what kind of person am I, controls your entire life. It controls your actions, it controls your reactions, it controls the decisions you make, the choices you make. Everything flows out of who do I think I am. And it happens at such a subconscious level that you don't even know it's happening. For example, you might be, you know, at home or whatever, you get a phone call that stresses you out. Straight away, your subconscious says, what kind of situation is this? It's a stressful situation. What kind of person am I? I am someone who eats when they're stressed. What does someone who eats when they're stressed do in a stressful situation? They eat. And so this goes through all of this process, but it's happening at a subconscious level. All I know is that I get off the phone, and now I've got a cookie in my hand. And I'm eating it going, why do I do this? I still remember being on holiday on the Gold Coast. Jess was eight. I've shared this before in church. It mortified me. Now, in our house, the kids' bedrooms are far away from the adults' bedroom, so I can't hear the rubbish that comes out of their mouth half the time. But in holiday, uh, we were like in this tiny apartment, so I could hear all their conversations. And at some point, you know, I was in the lounge, and the kids were in their bedroom, and one of the kids said something like, oh, Dad's eating a sandwich or something like that. And Jess, this eight-year-old, goes, that's because Dad stress eats. You don't remember that, do you? You said it. <laughs> right? Now, how many people know that an eight-year-old hasn't like, worked all of that out by herself? She's just heard mum telling dad off or dad being like, why am I doing this? You know, but my point is that no matter how hard I try to uh, not do that, for example, I'm just using an example, I'm never going to consist, I'm never going to break that habit until I change my view of who I am. So the first question I want you to ask yourself this morning is, what kind of person am I? The second question I want to ask you is, who do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? And you can break this down into different areas. What kind of husband do you want to be? What kind of wife do you want to be? What kind of father or mother do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be financially? Like, how, What sort of financial person do you want to be? What kind of leader do you want to be? These are some questions that I asked myself at the start of this year. Because here's, here's what I was feeling towards the end of last year. I've been around the sun many times. I have experienced many new years. I've had many opportunities to go, this year, this year I'm going to try hard. This year I'm going to whatever it might be. And I've never really had much success with it. But this year, I actually feel a really strong sense from God to make some changes. And it's almost like God has said to me, you know what, Josh? I've given you plenty of time to work this out on your own. I've given you plenty of time to take the initiative. I've given you plenty of time to think this is your decision. You haven't really done it. So now I'm just telling you, this is what you're doing. And and I feel like I have very little say in the matter. In some areas of my life where God has said, do this, and I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. Uh, And I wonder if that's true for more than just me. I wonder if actually the church is entering a season where God is saying, actually, I I need you guys focused, and I need you living on purpose, and I need you not just cruising through life with this automatic programming in your subconscious that you're not even aware of. Like, that's, I, I, I need... I need you to look at this. I was listening to a podcast from Chris Vallotton, who's a pastor over at Bethel Church, and he just delivered a prophetic word for the, the church globally, and he just said he really felt that January was like a halftime break. 
He said, you know, using the analogy of the game of life. You know, we're all out there playing the game of life and we're trying to do our best and we're trying to win and some of us are getting knocks and some of us are doing better than others and some of us are doing worse than others. And then the halftime whistle goes and you get to come off the field and you go into the changing room and you get to just sit down and you get to just grab a drink, suck on some oranges, maybe have a chat with your coach and the coach will say, hey, look, you know, guys, pulls the team together, you're doing really good. But here's a couple of things for us to work on. If we want to win this game, we're going to have to make a few changes here. You know, Grace, you're doing really well on the left, but we're going to shift you over to the right. There's a gap over there. I think your speed will get him. You know, Ben, we're going to move you to the front. Josh, we're going to stick you in goal. Like, you know, they, they make these changes, like some big changes, some little changes. And, and uh, Chris was just saying, he said, I feel like that's where the body of Christ is right now. Like, this is an opportunity to just kind of step back and go, what's working? Let's keep doing that. What's not working? Let's make some changes. Who do you want to be? One of the, one, I'll, I'll be completely transparent with you. One of the things that, that I wrote down in my journal, I said, I want to be an inspirational leader. I want to be a leader that inspires people, not just preaches a message or not just puts on a good service, but like you get around my life, you hang out with me outside of church. Like, this is an inspiring person to be around. That's, that's what I want to be. And so when you're talking about, well, what have I got planned for this year? What do I want to do this year? Who do I want to be this year? I just got a couple of thoughts, practical things to help you. First thing is start with the end in mind. So that's that question. Who do I want to be? Not what do I want to do, not what job do I want to have, but like who do I want to be? Look at these young adults writing this down. That's flipping awesome. Ben, you're writing it down. No, you are. You write it down. You put it in your pocket. How big is your little wee notebook? Look at that. Very good. Ben was telling me that he write, he write every sermon. He said, I write down everything you say. It scared me half to death. He said, I write down everything you say. And then I go and have lunch with my mum and dad. And they go, how was church? And he opens up his book and says, I'll tell you what Josh said. I was like, oh, my gosh. This is, like, this is terrifying. It's great. No, it's really good. You aren't taking notes. Maybe you want to be a person that takes notes in church. That's just a suggestion from me to you this year. <laughs> right, so the first question you want to ask is, who do I want to be? And uh, just a thought, I was thinking about it during the week. I know that last Sunday at the end, I said, look, go away and talk to God about this. And it was like a grandiose question, like, God, what do you want me to do with my life this year? Uh, and I thought afterwards, I was like, actually, that might be a bit daunting for a lot of people, including me. And then I thought, well, how, when I talk to God and God talks to me, like, what's the environment in which that happens? Like, how does that work? And honestly, most of the time when I'm talking to God, it's not that I've gone to God and said, all right, God, you're there and I'm here. And I sit down at his feet and I say, open up my book, God, what's the purpose of life? Go. Like, that's, you know, that's quite a lot of pressure. What, what tends to happen is that I just end up having a conversation with myself about myself, like an inner monologue. And I just... And very open to God invading that conversation. So what kind of person do I want to be? I didn't go to God and say, God, what kind of person do you want me to want to be? Like, I don't even want to want to be something that you don't want me to be. I just said, well, what kind of person do I want to be? And I just let that sit for a few days. And I came with a few different ideas. And then every now and again, a thought would pop into my head, like, what about this? And I'd be like, I hadn't thought about that. Is that you, God? Maybe that's God just going, hey, this is a great conversation that you're having with yourself, Josh. Let me add something to the mix. So what I would say in this process, you absolutely positively have to have input from God. But don't undervalue or underestimate how easy it is for God to invade a conversation that you're already having. It's like, if you've got a car and you're driving it and you decide that you want to turn right, it's very easy to turn a car right that's moving. If a car's just sitting there and you decide you want to turn right, it's really hard. Like you've got to push this thing, right? And so if you're already having these kind of conversations and you're already opening yourself up to like, man, I want to be a better version of myself. I believe that God's got a purpose for me and I want to find out what that is and what kind of person do I want to be. That's like you being a moving car. And then God can just jump in and just grab the wheel and give it a wee tweak. And then before you know it, you're on the, you're on the road that he wanted you to be on. If you're just not even having these conversations, you're just blah, 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 blah through life. 
He can tug on that wheel all he wants. The car's just going to sit there. You writing that down, Ben? That's a great analogy. <laughs> Mum and Dad would like that one. So what kind of person do I want to be? Right? Can you pass my phone? Sorry, honey, because I actually... I do have a note on my phone, singular. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause, my lovely assistant. Yeah. You guys respond to that. All right. Notes. Here we go. <coughs> so, oh look, I've written this down. What kind of church do we want to be? That's a good question. So start with that question, who do I want to be? Right? It's always who before do, is what I heard on the podcast. Always who before do. But here's the interesting thing, and I'm not going to take you too much longer, is that where does your subconscious get the information that it needs to form the opinion that it's formed about who you are? When your subconscious asks that question, what kind of person am I? You know, like you're out for lunch with someone, and they, at the end of it they go, ah, oh, I forgot my wallet. Ugh. Bang, subconscious. What kind of situation is this? Ugh. This is a situation where a financial situation. Question two, what kind of person am I? Am I a generous person or am I tight? Because that's going to dictate the answer to question three. What does a person like me do in this situation? Well, if your subconscious just searches through the, the Rolodex of info that it's got and then goes, bing, you're a generous person, then I'm going to go, oh, mate, don't worry about it. Lunch is on me. And it happens in a nanosecond. I don't have to process it all. It's not happening consciously. It's just coming out of who I am as a person. If it goes through the roller decks of information and goes, you're not a generous person, you're a tight person, then I'm going to go, ah, oh, dine and dash? No, I wouldn't do that. I would say, you know, I'd say, oh, mate, that's a shame. Let's just keep the receipt and uh, I'll flick you through my bank account and you can put the money through later on today. But the question then is, is like, well, what is the... What is your subconscious searching for when it's looking for the information? Belief. Belief. It's what it's looking for, Stephen, is it's looking for proof. It is searching through all of your actions. What, what happened last time this person was in this situation? What happened the time before that? When the pastor got up and talked about being generous, how did I respond to that sermon? Did I get grumpy? Did I walk out? Or did I lean in and engage? When the, there was an opportunity at church to give to missions or the roof, what did I do in that situation? Did I give or did I withhold? And it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And eventually your subconscious goes, you know what? Based on all of these actions, I think I know what kind of person we are. We're generous. And so next time something comes up, you don't have to process through all of this. Your subconscious just goes, I'm a generous person. This is how I live. This is what I do, or vice versa. And so once you've asked yourself the question, what kind of person do I want to be? You then need to ask the question, what does a person that is like this do? I want to be a generous person. That's what I've written down in my journal. I want to be a generous person. Okay, what does a generous person do? And you make a list of what a generous person does. And here's, here's the thing where, where people go so wrong with New Year's resolutions, is we always go way too big, way too unreasonable. Going to get a gym membership, going to join the gym, going to go to the gym five times a week. When was the last time you went to the gym? 1996. Well, what makes you think that you, this is going to work? And this is why it doesn't work, because every day you get up to go to the gym, and your subconscious goes, I'm not a person that goes to the gym. Why are we doing this? You go, shut up. And then the next day you get up. And you're like, I'm going to the gym. And your subconscious goes, but I'm not a person that goes to the gym. Like, why are we doing this? And then the next day you get up and you're like, oh, I could go to the gym or I could sleep in. And your subconscious goes, well, let me check and see what kind of person I am. Boom, 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 boom. Ah, we've gone to the gym twice in the last 10 years. And we've slept in 9,482 times. You're not a person that goes to the gym. You're a person that sleeps in. And that's, that's why it's so hard for us to form good habits because we're focusing on the, the thing rather than correcting our view of who we are. 
But the truth is that you've actually got to do both of these things at the same time. Because who you are dictates what you do, but what you do informs who you think you are. Flippin' ridiculous. The key is to make small changes. And this is where God is so helpful, right? You're having a conversation with yourself. What kind of person do I want to be? I said, I want to be an inspirational leader. What does an inspirational leader do? How does an inspirational leader live? What does an inspirational leader not do? What is an inspirational leader, you know, how do they not live? And so I'm like making myself a little wee list. And one of the things that, that struck out to me was, well, an inspirational leader, if you're around an inspirational leader, then at the end of it, you're like, I want my life to be like theirs. That's what inspiration is. So I'm like, I can't, you know, I, I can't live a lifestyle that other people hang out with and go, I don't want that. I don't want to be someone that is like always tired. Or always tired with an annoying little brother, which is worse. Right? And so I had, I had to take a hard look in the mirror. And I was like, you know what? What's been coming out of my mouth for the last six months is like, I'm tired. Always tired. And I had convinced myself that I was always tired. And I thought I was justifiably tired because I've got so much going on in my life. Then I listened to another podcast, and this lady was like, no one is always anything. You're just not aware when you're not those things. And, and so I was like, okay, if I want to be an inspirational leader, I can't talk like that. That's another thing. Add it to your list. How do I, how do I talk? The power of life and death is in the tongue, right? I love this quote. Every action you take is a vote toward the type of person you want to become. No single instant transforms your whole belief. But as the votes build up, so does the evidence of your new identity. If you want to change who you are, if you want to change your life, you've got to change who you are. You've got to change who you think you are. Because the truth is that you are awesome. You are created by God. You beat out 300 million other potentials and God went, you're the best. You're what I need in this moment. I've got a plan for you and a hope for you and a future for you. That's the truth. But we end up believing lies about ourselves. I was reading a book this week. I shared this with the staff team. I even told Jared about it yesterday. I'm reading a book by a guy called Ewan McManus. Has anyone heard of Ewan McManus? He's, yeah, only hardcore Christians. He's actually a really big deal. He pastors a church in California he, uh, called Mosaic. He has a podcast that hundreds of thousands of people listen to. He's got a very successful big church. He's a highly sought-after international speaker. He's married, and his marriage is great, and he's got kids that serve God. And in, in every area of his life, you would look at it and go, that guy's successful. That guy's winning at life. And yet I was reading in his book, he said, he said, I don't even know who my dad is. I've got no idea who my dad is. He said, my last name, McManus, he said, I took that from a man who hitched up with my mum when I was two years old. He never married her. He never became my stepfather. He was just like a surrogate dad to me for many, many years. He said, I loved him like I would love my father. He was, for all intents and purposes, my dad. And his last name was McManus, so I took the name McManus. And then when I was in my late teens, my whole world came crashing down. He said, we found out that this man that had been with us for 15 years was a con man. He said, if you've seen the movie Catch Me If You Can with Leonardo DiCaprio, he's like, that's my dad. McManus wasn't even his name. It was in one of many aliases that he had. And he said, we had a huge fight about it. And uh, he ended up leaving the family. He said, my last memory of him was his face through the windscreen of the car as he hit me leaving the house. He was trying to stop his dad from leaving, and the guy sideswiped him as he left. And he said, I didn't see him for 15, 20 years. Had kids. And he said, my, my son started asking me, Dad, I want to meet the man who gave us our last name. And he thought, you know what? You probably deserve that. So he said, we old school hunted him down like PIs. Like we, and we found him you know, in, a, in a part of town in another state. 
And they contacted him, and he said, my son wants to meet you. And he said, okay. And he said, I took my son to meet him, and he said, everything was going fine. And then right at the very end, he said, I said, right, it's time to go. We stood up to leave, and this surrogate father of his that had raised him grabbed his son and said, hey, just before you go, there's something you need to know. Your father, Irwin, is average. He's never been anything other than average. His brother was spectacular, but your father is average. Those are the last words he ever heard his dad say, or his surrogate dad. And he says this in the book. He said, what hurt the most was not that this man that had raised me said that about me. It wasn't even that he said it to my own son in front of me. What hurt the most is that when he said it, I knew he was right. I knew that that's what I believed about myself. He said, and how can I get angry at someone else for believing about me what I believe about me? How can I get angry at someone else for just agreeing with how I see myself? And he said, that conversation was the catalyst for me making a number of changes to my life, which has led him to become the person that he is. He's now in like his 60s, late 50s, early 60s. He realized that through his, he looked at his life and he went, you know, every area of my life, whether it's school, whether it's post school, whether it's relationships, he said, in every area, I was average. And so his subconscious had just adopted this, I am an average person. And so every situation that came across his path, it would say, how does, a, how does an average person respond to this? And that's how he would respond. You've got to change the answer to that question. And you need input from God to do it. And then once you've identified who you want to be, then you say, okay, what are some of these small decisions that might look insignificant at the time that I need to make in my life? Some of these small changes. There's a great book called Atomic Habits by a guy. Do you know who wrote it, Josh? I can't remember the guy who wrote it. Anyway, it's called Atomic Habits. It's along this topic where this guy specializes in helping people break bad habits and form good habits. And one of the things he says is the problem with trying to form a good habit is you can't form a good habit if it's inconsistent with who you think you are as a person. Classic example, people going to the gym. He'll take clients and he'll say, look, here's what we're going to do. If you decide that you're going to go to the gym five days a week, you'll last two, maybe three weeks, and then you'll quit. And then you've formed a new pattern of thinking, which is that I'm someone that quits. So every time you try something new and it gets hard and your subconscious goes, what kind of situation is this? It's a hard situation. What do I do in hard situations? I quit. I'm going to quit. You don't realize you're thinking all this stuff, but that's what you're going to do. And so he said, here's what we're going to do. And so he'd take his client and he'd say, right, you want to become someone that goes to the gym. You need to identify. This is who I am as a person. I've got a joke now with Andre, who's the pastor at Cornerstone. Every time I go to the gym, I'm I'm going to the gym, Andre, because that's who I am as a person. That's what I say. And so he would take his clients and he'll be like, right, we're going to rewire your brain so that you become a person that goes to the gym. But if you only go 10 or 15 times, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to go like 40 or 50 or 60 times. But if you go to the gym and try and work out for three hours every time because you've got this news resolution to get buff by Easter, that's not going to happen. So he will literally get his clients to drive to the gym, walk in the door, and then turn around and walk out. That's it. And he'll say, that's all you're allowed to do for two weeks. Drive to the gym, walk in, turn around and walk out. Because you are just training. I am someone that goes to the gym, whatever it might be. He had a client that said, look, I want to be someone that runs every morning. He said, if you try and run every morning, go cold turkey, you'll quit. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to set your alarm every morning for 6 o'clock. You're going to get out of bed. You're going to put your running shoes on. Then you can hop back into bed and keep sleeping. He said, you've got to do that for a month. You're just training this. I am someone that gets out of bed and puts on my shoes every morning at 6 o'clock, whatever it might be. What I'm saying is don't, don't overlook the small, the small things. Your goal is to change how you see yourself. And you do that not by just coming up with better versions of you, but by talking to God about it. Is that cool? I don't know if this is helping at all. But we're done. You do what you do because of what you think of you. Confucius says. 
<clears throat> There's another line that I've written down here, and I don't know if this came from a podcast or if God said it to me, but it got stuck in my brain at some point. Maybe I heard it somewhere. Uh, and this, this is the mantra that I'm living by at the moment. Do first what matters most. So one of my, this is embarrassing to admit, because you probably think I did this anyway, but I didn't. But one of my, my changes is I'm, like, I'm going to get up every morning and read my Bible. Every morning. Get up and do it before I do anything else. Now, I did read my Bible, and I did spend time with God, but I wouldn't always do it first thing in the morning because we've got a very unique lifestyle. I pastor a church. It's not the sort of job where I've got to be in the office by 8.15 every morning. You know, we run our own businesses, not the sort of job where you've got to be there at a certain time. And then we homeschool our kids, so we don't even have like a school run that we've got to get up for. So there's no, oftentimes, there's absolutely no external reason to set an alarm, get up, start our day. And sometimes I quite enjoy just having a sleep in and then let the day just kind of happen. But before I know it, I'm 5% through the day. (laughs) And so this year, God said to me, said, I want you to get up every morning. (laughs) And when I said this to my brother and sister, they laughed at me. But he said, I want you to get up every morning at 6.45. Okay, no, that's good. So early. Oh, so early for me. But hey, also, I also work quite late, to be fair, like, Sometimes I'm still working at, you know, 10 o'clock. So 6.45, every morning at 6.45. He said, I don't want you to look at your phone. I don't want you to check sports results. I don't want you to have it. I don't want you to check your emails. I don't want you to check, you know, the business numbers from the night before. You get up. The first thing you do is because you do first what matters most. And so that's what I'm doing. What are we today? Today's the 21st. I'm doing good. Every morning, 6.45, get up. Didn't do it yesterday morning just in case Liz is going to hit me up about it later. But that's because I didn't get to bed till like 1 o'clock in the morning the night before. Also, I spent a lot of time with God last week. You've got no idea. So I felt like it was, it was okay. <laughs> like more than a normal week, like, like an average of two weeks combined into one period, so I'm okay. Have an easy week this week. No, that's a joke. That's silly. That's a dumb thing to say. All right? Do first what matters most. Ask yourself the question, who do I want to be? Ask yourself the question, what do I have to do so that my subconscious can learn that this is the kind of person? You've got to be intentional. Otherwise, your subconscious will just rule your life. And you'll end up responding and reacting and making decisions based on bad impressions of who you are. You'll nut out, you'll lose your temper, you'll carry anxiety around, You'll struggle to stay healthy. You'll make bad decisions because that's just what your subconscious wants you to do. You'll end up eating cookies all the time. All right? You don't want to be a plop. What's a plop, Anne? Purpose, person living on purpose. Yes, plop. I'm going to write a book about it. It's going to catch on. It's going to be huge. And you can all say, I was there when he first kind of tested it. Didn't really land, but he just kept going. Good on him. All right? Jeez. I'm going to end it here because it's just, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth next. All right. God bless. Have a great Sunday. Be a plop today. Be a plop tomorrow. Be a plop every day. And I, I look forward to hearing who it is that God wants you to be. What did you say to me? Stay around and have a coffee and cookies. Oh, there's cookies? That's awkward. Okay. All right. God bless. Have a great one. Everybody watching online, see you later. Okay.